There's a whole family of 60-ton killing machines in the water, and only one bald-headed hero who can stop them. When you're planning your next vacation, do yourself a favor first, and make sure that wherever you're going, it's on the other side of the planet from Jonas Taylor and his group of goldfish-brained friends. We all know that when science and money mix, global tragedy is sure to follow, so we're gonna point out where it all went wrong and what we'd do differently as we break down how to beat the family of Megs and other horrors of the deep in Meg 2, The Trench. <laughs> These scientists want to get rich or die trying, and you can probably guess how that's going to turn out. It's five years after their first run-in with the Meg, and the Mana One research station is under new management. Jonas Taylor, a former barfly turned shark fighting superstar, has been keeping himself busy these days by filling in for Captain Planet and fighting pollution as an environmental vigilante, while also taking care of Mei Ling the 14-year-old daughter of his love interest, Suyin, who recently got the off-screen death treatment. Yikes. The girl's uncle, Zhu Ming, has taken over control of the company, and over the years, they've made incredible breakthroughs in technology thanks to financing from a wealthy investor. But as they're about to soon find out, she's been working on an operation of her own, and it's definitely not about saving the whales. One night at a high-class event, celebrating the 10th anniversary of their new Oceanic Institute, Zhu Ming announces that they've developed submarines that can pass through the thermocline, a deep ocean layer of freezing cold water that acts as a barrier for the uncharted, meg-infested depths below. If this sounds like a recipe for disaster, then you're absolutely right. But we wouldn't have a sequel without some scientists making dumb decisions now, would we? Speaking of dumb decisions, it turns out that Zhu Ming found one of the sharks as a pup and raised her there at the Institute, giving her the name Haiki. No chance that this could backfire, right? By now, she's grown into a massive killing machine, but he's brave enough to get in the water with her because, according to him, they share a special bond. In his hand, he's holding a device that creates a pulse in the water. One press calls the shark to his location, and two presses send her away. Okay, there has to be a safer way to do this. Not only is the guy the only surviving relative of his poor 14-year-old niece, but he's also the figurehead of a multi-billion dollar company with who knows how many employees relying on this job to feed their families and keep a roof over their heads. If he ends up as Meg Food all for the sake of some dumb experiment, then the trauma that everyone's going to be left with after watching him get eaten alive is probably going to be the least of their worries. And with the most advanced technology in the world at his disposal, there's really no reason to willingly put himself in this kind of danger, other than to prove how brave he is. We get it, Zhu Ming. You're a big man who can face off with a Meg, just like Jonas and your late sister. But the difference is that while they did it to save countless innocent civilians from a violent death, you're doing it just because you can. Is it badass? Yeah, I'll give you that. But is it also completely idiotic? Absolutely. So do the world a favor and use your unlimited wealth and technology to come up with a less risky way to try out your little button, even if it's just for Mei Ying's sake. Seriously, she's standing right there. What do you think it would do to her teenage mind to watch her uncle get obliterated by a 50-ton apex predator? Think of the children, man. From the last encounter, we know that you already have the materials to build a cave that can withstand a meg bite. The only problem was that the cage was way too small and the shark nearly swallowed it whole. The solution here seems pretty obvious. Use the same material, but make it bigger and design the cage in a way so that it can't be easily swallowed. It's estimated that a full-grown meg had a maximum bite span of about three and a half meters or 11 feet wide. So building the cage into a 12 by 12 foot square instead of the standard cylinder shape should render it impossible to be swallowed by high key here and leave you safe to play around with your pet shark all day long if you really want to. Now, shark cages are great, but you know what's even more safe? 
never getting in the water with a Megalodon at all. This might sound crazy, but believe it or not, it's actually possible to do this experiment without using your own fragile, very squishy human body as bait. I'll let you in on a secret. You know those life-size dummies that lifeguards and firefighters use for practice? They run for, give or take, about $1,000, which you could probably find just by searching through the couch cushions in this state-of-the-art facility that's worth more than the entire GDP of most countries. Just drop one of those things in there to test out your theory while you watch from the safety of the observation deck like everyone else who has a brain. Next time, use a dummy, dummy. That way, you won't have to put your own life at risk to prove an experiment that, at the end of the day, doesn't really provide you with much useful information anyway. At first, everything goes according to plan, with the giant shark coming and going just like he said it would. Zhu Ming considers it a success, but suddenly, the observation team picks up something large circling back around on the scanner. It's the shark, and she's moving in fast. Zhu Ming presses the button, but this time, the shark isn't responding. As she closes in, he pulls his escape cord at the last possible moment, and everyone else looks away, convinced that he just became fish food. Unfortunately, it looks like they won't be getting off work early after all, because the man confidently struts into the room like it was no big deal, having managed to get away just in time. It was a close call, but they're no strangers to taking risks in the name of science. After loading up their equipment, the team boards a helicopter and heads off to the research station. That night back at the institute, the shark decides that it's time for an adventure of her own. Swimming as fast as she can, she uses her momentum to crash right through a metal grate, making her way into an underwater service tunnel that leads straight out into the open ocean. The next day, the two teams board their subs and descend towards the ocean floor, while the surface team observes from back at the station. On the way down, Jonas notices that the sub is using oxygen faster than expected, blaming it on his co-pilot Rigus for being nervous. But things get serious when they realize the truth. While they were prepping the subs, Mei Ying snuck on board. Furious, Jonah tells them to stop the dive and says they're going back up, but the girl is determined not to listen, pointing out that the sub is equipped with anti-predator systems, and she even snuck in her own emergency dive suit for the slim possibility that everything goes horribly wrong. The team picks up a Meg closing in on them fast, and they realize that it's none other than Zhu Ming's pet from back at the Institute. Panicking, the two subs dive towards the bottom and activate their countermeasures. But Jonas points out that by the time the devices are charged up, it'll already be too late, leaving them with no other choice but to dive through the thermocline to get away. Okay, this is an unbelievably bad idea. Just when I was thinking that swimming with a Meg by choice was the dumbest decision that we'd be seeing today, this crew continues to find new and exciting ways to put their lives at risk in the name of science. In what world is diving into the thermocline the safest solution here? Do they need to be reminded that that's exactly where the Megs came from in the first place? How could it possibly be a good idea to go down there where there could be more Megs, not to mention giant squids and who knows what else, especially with a child on board? The first rule of Meg safety is that you don't have to be faster than the shark to get away. You just have to be faster than the sub next to you. They could have easily pulled back to the surface and hoped that the shark went in after the other sub first. But since they're technically on the same team here, there's also a way that they could have worked together to get to safety. Knowing that Mei Ying's life was at risk, what they really needed to do here was use her uncle's sub as a meat shield to get the shark's attention and dive down towards the thermocline as a distraction, while Jonas's sub made a break for the surface. Even if the shark ended up going after them before they made it all the way back to the station, they only needed a short window to get the electric countermeasures up and running and they'd be good to go. Then they could safely drop Mei Ying off and regroup back at base while they figure out how to get her uncle's pet Meg back under control because after all, they can't just carry on with their research now that she's out roaming in the open ocean and looking for innocent bystanders to chomp. If you're going to keep a semi-truck sized shark for a pet, then you should probably consider what to do if it ever got loose. She might seem harmless if 
you're completely delusional. But an animal like that could mean big trouble under the wrong conditions. You need to have a failsafe, just in case one day your fishy friend decides to go on a rampage. For someone like Jimung here, with an unlimited wealth and the most advanced technology available, this should be incredibly easy. Researchers already use satellite tags to track sharks as they migrate all around the globe. Using similar technology, Zhu Ming could have tagged this shark with a tracker as well, but instead of occasionally sending her location to a team of scientists, it would be constantly uploading her whereabouts to a station full of underwater drones armed with high explosives. That way, if the shark ever breached its perimeter, then the drones would automatically be activated and swarm to its location, blowing it into chum and keeping the waters at your local tourist trap safe for everyone else. Of course, when you're relying on automated technology, there's always a chance for something to go wrong, so it couldn't hurt to have outfitted the subs with some offensive equipment as well. Even though they weren't planning to go meg hunting, just knowing from experience what's lurking below the thermocline, a few torpedoes could definitely be worth the extra weight in a pinch. After what happened last time, why are they still sending manned crews down there at all? Surely it'd be safer and cheaper to send unmanned vehicles on these types of missions. Then they could do all their exploring from the comfort of the station and wouldn't have to put any additional lives at risk to rescue them if history repeats itself, which we all know by now it's definitely going to do. Unfortunately, these brainiacs seem determined never to learn from their mistakes, and my thoughts and prayers go out to anyone on board who isn't a main character. Good luck, you're going to need it. As they descended into the abyss, the subs switch over to low frequency lights so that they won't attract any more megs. Somehow the shark is still after them, but they manage to get countermeasures active just in time. Just then, they pick up several more enormous sharks coming towards them on the scanner. Swimming by is the largest meg that anyone's ever seen, and for some reason, it's traveling with the two others. In a moment of incredible stupidity, Zhu Ming here decides that they should follow the 60-ton death machines into uncharted waters. For science, of course. But that was their biggest mistake. Jonas here reminds him that they still do have a 14-year-old child on board, but the kid's uncle guarantees him that everything is going to be just fine. Still, as the only responsible adult, Jonas has to make one thing clear. If he sees anything dangerous, then he's turning this sub around and headed straight back to the surface. Because apparently, the three megalodons and the 16 pounds per square inch of water pressure that they're already working with aren't perilous enough to qualify. The crews stay as low as possible, following the sharks through a kelp forest deeper into the unexplored sector. Looking above, they notice that the sharks came there to to mate, which can only mean one thing. More Meg Juniors are on the way, and Jonas is less than thrilled at the idea. There's something even stranger than baby-making Megs out here, though. And as they reach the top of a volcanic crest, they stumble upon a whole-ass top-secret underwater base. They don't realize it yet, but what they're looking at is a black market operation gathering rare deep-sea minerals for an unknown supplier. On a ridge nearby, this criminal Montez notices the Manta One crew in the trench below him, and decides that they've already seen too much. Flipping a switch, he donates the chain of mining explosives, sacrificing two of his divers, while hoping to bury Jonas and his friends in the landslide. The sub crews take evasive action as huge boulders start raining down all around them, but the falling debris knocks off one of the sub's ballast tanks, pinning Jonas and his crew in place. Zhu Ming's sub moves in, slicing through the cable and setting them free, but they aren't able to get out fast enough, and both subs end up buried beneath the rubble. Back on the surface, the outlook isn't good, as they've lost all vital signs from both subs. Mac quickly sends this researcher, Jess, to prepare the rescue vehicle, but there's a problem. The battery was intentionally
intentionally shorted out, rendering the sub useless in a way that looks suspiciously like an inside job. The crew manages to get the computer systems back online, and after finding out that the rescue sub won't be an option, Jonas here decides that they only have one other choice. They're going to put on their dive suits and walk back to the underwater base on foot, with nothing but a positive attitude and some good old-fashioned plot armor to see them safely through. After suiting up and arming everyone with a spear gun, they press on into the impenetrable darkness, 25,000 feet below the ocean's surface. Not 50 yards from the abandoned sub, they end up running into Jimung and his crew, who are still very much alive. It turns out that they both came up with the same plan, and although Mei Ying is overjoyed to see him, they'll have to save the family reunion for later. There isn't much time, and they need to get over to the station before they run out of air, or the Megs come back for another bite. The crew makes their way across the trench floor in a single file line, marveling at the bioluminescent life surrounding them. Looking around, this researcher Lance notices that he's surrounded by dozens of colorful baby octopi. They're actually pretty cute, but what he doesn't realize is that their mother is watching too. Suddenly, a massive eyeball appears right behind him, and by the time that the others hear his screams, Lance is already done for. As his empty helmet floats down in front of them, Jonas says that they need to move on because otherwise they'll all be next. They're only 400 meters away from the station when Zhu Ming picks up several objects closing in on them fast. Luckily, they're too small to be Megs, but he knows that whatever it is can't be good. Jonas orders everyone to run as quickly as they can, when suddenly, a swarm of reptile-like creatures, called snappers, comes at them over the ridge, forcing them to stand their ground. In the chaos, one of the creatures punctures this diver's helmet, adding to the danger of her already low oxygen supply. Just when it looks like they're about to be overwhelmed, Zhu Ming ignites an incredibly bright flare driving the creatures away. But they aren't safe yet, because the sudden burst of light ends up attracting the Megs right to them. Seeing the sharks coming, Zhu Ming prepares to sacrifice himself for the rest of the group. But Jonas stops him at the last moment, loading the flare into his spear gun and firing it up onto a nearby metal structure as a distraction. They run as fast as they can, but there's a Meg closing in, and Sal realizes that she isn't going to make it, pushing Zhu Ming out of the way, and sacrificing sacrificing herself as the shark moves in and swallows her whole. The last two survivors make it to the airlock, sealing the door just as one of the Megs crashes into the station right behind them. They're safe, but before the pressure in the room can stabilize, one of the researcher's helmets suddenly implodes from being punctured in the fight, killing her instantly. But they still have a long way to go. Okay, that's a brutal way to go out, especially so close to safety, and the sad truth is that it probably could have been avoided if they just kept it moving towards the airlock. The snappers were definitely going to reach them before they got there, but why make a stand out in the open when they could have grouped up and stayed on the move? With the trained fighters forming a perimeter around the rest of the team as they made their escape, they were never going to be able to kill them all, but with any luck, they would have been able to keep the creatures back long enough to make it to the airlock without anyone getting chomped, since they know that even a minor suit puncture could be fatal at these depths. With this in mind, it's also surprising that they didn't come up with a method for temporarily sealing the mask in just such a situation. They have access to the most advanced technology on the planet, so why not develop some sort of rapid sealing gel that they could quickly spray over the surface of the mask? It doesn't have to be perfect, just able to close up the holes long enough for them to get to safety without their helmet imploding. Hell, I've got a feeling that Phil Swift could have fixed that bad boy right up with nothing but a little bit of flex tape. Even Zhu Ming just putting his hands over the holes and trying to do something instead of just standing there would have at least been worth the effort. Now, they're down to just four survivors, and they're about to find out who's really behind this secret operation. As they look around, the place seems to be completely abandoned, with no sign of any crew. Stepping through a doorway, they discover a control room of recently mined rare earth minerals, which Zhu Ming estimates could be worth over one billion dollars her box. Using the communications system, Mei Ying manages to get in contact with Jess back on the surface. After explaining to her what they've found, she tells them that there are two emergency escape pods on the other side of the station, which should still
still be operational. The crew eventually arrives at the pod bay, but the controls for the vehicles aren't working. Suddenly, the only door closes remotely, and that's when Jess appears on the screen, revealing that she's the one who locked down the room. She tries to pay them off to forget what they've seen, but Jonas won't go for it, demanding justice for the lives of his three friends. In response, the woman jettisons one of the escape pods, leaving them with only one remaining. Now speaking to Rigus, she tells her that she can still save Mei Ying, but only if she uses her spear gun to kill Jonas on the spot. Jonas tells her to do it, willing to sacrifice himself so that the others can live, but she can't turn on her friend, even if it means that they're all going to die. Furious, Jess releases the last escape pod, leaving them with no way out. That's when Driscoll takes over, explaining that they're going to use Zhu Ming's technology to plunder the ocean of its natural resources, and orders Jess to flood the chamber, threatening to drown them all unless they can find a way to escape. Things are looking bad, but Jonas here has a plan. He's going to go out through one of the escape pod airlocks and swim back to where they originally came in, opening the jammed door from the other side. Mei Ying asks how he won't be killed instantly, and Rigus explains that Jonas can force water into his sinuses. He could potentially survive for up to 60 seconds, even at these depths, before he blacks out. Taking a spear gun, he steps into the chamber and swims out into the abyss, ready to do the impossible once again. Jonas swims for his life, as the Megs circle the water all around him. Thanks to that good old plot armor, he reaches the airlock without any trouble, but loses consciousness as the doors close, and the water slowly drains out of the room. A few moments later, Jonas wakes up only to find that the criminal, Montez, has made it aboard the station and taken him hostage. For some reason, this criminal mastermind allows Jonas to stand up, and the two immediately get into a huge brawl. Even armed with a knife, Montez proves to be no match for the man who fought off a Meg. And after kicking his ass, Jonas is finally able to press the airlock release, setting his friends free just in time. The crew makes it to Montez's sub, but realizes that the hydraulics are leaking and the anti-predator devices are down, meaning that they'll get chomped by the Megs the minute that they leave the station. That's when Zhu Ming decides that their best chance to escape is if he manually activates the lights on the station to serve as a distraction. Sprinting back to the control room, he lights the place up like a Christmas tree, and sure enough, the Megs immediately begin to attack. Rigus starts to panic, insisting that they need to close the hatch and leave Zhu Ming behind, but Jonas refuses to go without him. With only seconds to spare, Zhu Ming makes it back to the sub, and they speed out of the station as the Megs rip the place apart. As they breach back through the thermocline, he notices a box of explosives on board, and decides to save them in case they run into any trouble later. Looking out the window, they see that the blast from earlier created a massive hole in the layer of freezing water. Although it'll only be open for about an hour before it naturally closes up, this leaves a door for the Megs and other deep sea monsters to get right through, and as they pull away, they never realize that the massive octopus is following in their tracks. Meanwhile, Montez uses a dive suit and flotation device to sneak his way back to the surface, still determined to get his revenge. Okay, well, if it isn't exactly what happened last time. Except now with even more horrifying creatures of the deep looking to chomp down on some tourists. We all know where this is going. It won't be long before the sharks head over to some densely populated resort and start devouring swimmers by the dozen. So right about now, it seems like it'd be a good time to have some meg fighting tools at your disposal. Since they've already dealt with this problem once, you'd think that the engineers back at the station should have had some idea in place for how to close up the thermocline if another hole ever opened. What I'm thinking here is some sort of device containing freezing cold gas that they could drop into the hole in order to quickly seal it back up before the Megs ever had a chance to follow them through. Now, making sure that the sharks never got through in the first place is definitely the safest method, but once they're out in the open ocean, that's when the real fun can start. We've already covered torpedoes and drone swarms, which would certainly do the trick, but with this much money and advanced technology, why not get a little bit more creative? 
There's only one direction to go from here, and that's anti-meg mech suits, of course. I know what you're thinking, a mech suit? Even if they had the technology, there's no way that they can actually afford to build one. Well, it's my pleasure to inform you that somebody's already crunched the numbers and estimated that a functioning mech would cost approximately $750 million to build. That's an awful lot of Robux, but remember, just one of those boxes full of rare earth minerals is worth a cool billion and they've got a whole mining station full of them or at least they did before Jonas and company came along and destroyed the whole operation at 60 feet tall and weighing 60 tons one mobile suit would be more than a match for a meg get two or three of those bad boys going and arm them with some giant swords and long-ranged weapons and they could put the entire species back into extinction for good this time it's been five years since their first encounter with the Meg. Plenty of time to put a couple of these together. Is it the most practical solution? Not at all. Is it even necessary when they could use some torpedoes to get the job done? Also no. But I just want to see Jonas here in a Pacific Rim fight with a Megalodon and a giant octopus, and you should too. As a final thought, if there's one thing that you can guarantee that any top secret underwater base is going to have, it's a self-destruct protocol. As they were fleeing the station, if Zhuming could have figured out a way to set the place to blow, then they could have wiped out all the megs out in one shot before they ever had a chance to get up to the surface. Of course, this might have run the risk of blowing an even bigger hole in the thermocline, so maybe it's for the best that they didn't think of this one after all. Up on the station, Mac and DJ see Jess waiting for them outside, and she's flanked by several heavily armed private contractors. Realizing that these guys must be there to kill them, DJ opens his bag and hands Mac a taser, ready to fight for their lives. The first part of the plan goes perfectly, with DJ flinging open the door and hitting them with some pepper spray. But instead of closing it and waiting, Mac walks right out into the cloud, blinding himself as well. Jess reaches for one of the soldier's guns, but DJ quickly hits her with the taser. When Jonas and his crew arrive, they notice the soldiers taking over the station and decide to sneak on board. Jonas tells Rigus to take Mei Ying and find an escape boat, while he and her uncle go to find the others. After narrowly escaping from more of the guards, DJ explains that he learned his lesson from their last run-in with the Meg. Opening his bag, he pulls out a 50 caliber Desert Eagle pistol, fully loaded with poison-tipped bullets, which he learned from watching Jaws 2. With the soldiers opening fire, they decide to run through another doorway, but end up with a rifle pointed straight at their head, forcing them to surrender. The soldiers lead them back through the station, when suddenly Zhu Ming comes flying through one of the doors, pretending that he's been threatened by somebody else just out of sight. And just as the soldiers let their guard down, Jonas bursts out of another doorway right next to them, taking them down with one quick move and successfully rescuing the boys. Down in the control room, Montez tells Jess that Jonas has made it to the station, and she orders her men to lock the place down. While coming up with their cover story, she notices one of the sharks swimming by outside, but says that she isn't worried, pointing out that the place is supposed to be meg-proof. Suddenly, the shark bursts straight through the window and flooding the chamber with water. That makes one bad guy down, with two more to go. Okay, it looks like Karma finally caught up to our backstabbing businesswoman here. I guess that promotion's going to have to wait because Jess, you f***ed up. First of all, this is exactly what happens when you underestimate the Meg. Sure, you might have thought that the station was Meg-proof, but you still don't say that out loud. The glass might have stopped them in the past, but that's before the biggest shark that anyone's ever seen was in the picture and it only took about 15 seconds for you to be proven wrong. That's what we in the business call f***ing around and finding out. It's hard to say that you didn't have it coming though. After all, you knowingly chose to work for a woman who's perfectly comfortable with killing off her own competition just to get ahead. That's not to mention that just a little while ago, you were about to doom an actual child to a watery grave all so that she wouldn't expose your boss's plans. That's cold-blooded, even for the Meg here, and when you're making a 60-ton man-eater look like the good guy, 
then you've uh, made some unethical decisions to say the least. As a matter of fact, these sharks would have never even escaped in the first place if it weren't for the shady business dealings of the woman who you work for. So you and Driscoll here are essentially to blame for this whole incident. And it looks like you finally got what was coming to you in the end. Now there's three megs, a giant octopus, and a whole swarm of messed up crocodile creatures about to wreak havoc on some innocent bystanders. And you won't even get a share of the profits if your boss somehow makes it out alive. When you do all of the dirty work, only to end up as shark bait, Jess, you f***ed up. Meanwhile, Jonas and the other survivors load into a small boat, deciding to paddle out instead of using the motor so that they won't attract the Meg's attention. A team of soldiers comes after them, but Montez immediately warns them to cut the engine. Just when they're about to take the shot, one of the sharks explodes up from underneath them, dragging the whole boat down below the surface, with Jonas and crew quickly taking the opportunity to speed away. Jonas here starts sawing some metal spikes into spears and attaching the explosives that they found on Montez's sub. Zhu Ming realizes that the Megs are heading right towards a densely populated resort called Fun Island saying that they need to find a way to distract the sharks or else countless people could be killed. On a boat just off the coast, these partygoers are suddenly attacked by a giant octopus. After landing on the island, Montez and Driscoll are attacked by a roaming group of snappers, forcing them to retreat back to their helicopter. Hearing the gunfire, the tourists all began to panic, and Jonas realizes that they need to inform the local authorities Thinking quickly, he sends DJ and Rigus to find a radio station where they can call for help, and tells Mei Ying to hide in a nearby lifeguard tower until he gets back, making her promise to actually listen for once. That's when the Megs finally show up and start devouring tourists by the dozen. Jonas says that they need to each board a jet ski and lead the sharks back out to sea, using the spears that he built to kill them if necessary. Okay, the spears are a great start, but why would you not use all the tools at your disposal here? Let's not forget that there's also a house-sized octopus also currently gobbling down tourists just a short distance away. If it were me, I'd be leading the Megs right to it and letting these sea creatures clash it out without ever having to get myself directly involved. Let them fight. Battling the octopus should at least keep them busy for a little while, and it might even take one of the sharks out for you if you're lucky. At the very least, letting them focus on fighting each other would buy Jonas and crew some time to get as many people as they could safely out of harm's way, before circling back to deal with whichever of the creatures survived. Playing these predators against each other is just too good of an opportunity to pass up, especially when your only other solution is to ride towards them on a jet ski and hit the 60-ton behemoths with a makeshift spear. It's time to get creative before it's too late, and I'd be more than happy to let that eight-armed abomination handle some of the dirty work while I figured out what to do next. Back at the helipad, Driscoll notices that she's suddenly all alone, with her guards having been taken out by the snappers. She grabs a rifle and gets back to the chopper, but one of the creatures sneaks in through the open door on the other side dragging her off to the jungle to be devoured. That makes two bad guys down with one more to go. When Jonas and the others get down to the bench, they realize that there's only one jet ski available, meaning that he'll have to go it alone, while Zhu Ming and Mac find another way to help. Getting on, he speeds into the water right past the Megs, successfully luring them into deeper waters away from the shore. Zhu Ming and Mac find a shed full of fertilizer, and decide that they can use it to make a bomb. A bunch of soldiers come in after being chased down by the snappers and immediately order both of them to freeze. DJ and Rigus manage to find a satellite phone on one of the dead soldiers. Suddenly, they end up face to face with more of the snappers and DJ tells her to run on the count of three, but by the time that he turns around, she's already long gone. They end up taking cover in the maintenance shed, where they find themselves right in the middle of the standoff that's already going on between their friends and the soldiers. Zhu Ming notices a red button on the wall and quickly comes up with a plan to escape. He gives the soldiers one last chance to surrender, but when they refuse, he pokes DJ in the stomach, causing him to back up into the button and open the garage door. 
The gang of snappers waiting outside instantly rushes in and starts tearing the guards to pieces, giving the others a chance to escape out of the back door just as stray bullets ignite the fertilizer and blow the whole place sky high. After confirming that the satellite phone is working, Zhu Ming leaves DJ and Rigus to call for help, while he and Mac take an off-road vehicle with plans to steal the chopper. Out on the water, Jonas flings an explosive spear at one of the sharks but hits just in front of it without getting the kill. Another Meg blasts up from under him, and this time he surfs the wave right towards the third shark, hitting it dead on with a spear and blowing a huge chunk out of its head. That makes one Meg down, with two more to go. Zhu Ming and Mac make it to the helipad, but it's surrounded by snappers. And to make things worse, the chopper is out of fuel. Zhu Ming hooks up the fuel line and jumps on as the chopper takes off. But before they can escape, the creature leaps up at them, knocking him back to the ground. He uses a hose to douse the snappers in gasoline, before running back to the chopper while Mac fires a flare gun into the crowd, incinerating them all as they fly to safety. Jonas races towards one of the sharks with his spear in hand, but all of a sudden, Montez shows up and opens fire, causing him to drop it into the water and veer off course. As he's maneuvering between the docks, he notices Mei Ying in the water trying to rescue people from the giant octopus and decides that he better go make sure that she's safe instead. Zhu Ming also notices this going on, telling Mac to bring him in closer, but the octopus reaches out with its massive tentacle, pulling the entire chopper down just as he dives onto the dock with the makeshift bomb in his hands. After being attacked by one of the Megs, Jonas ends up on the dock too, running for his life as the shark chomps through the wood right behind him, and eventually falling back into the water. Realizing that he's still alive, Montez jumps off of his boat and starts firing at him through the boardwalk, so Jonas grabs the only weapon more dangerous than an LMG, a sharp wooden stick. He reaches up and stabs Montez before quickly disarming him and using the weapon to break his nose. Montez stands there ready to be shot, but Jonas here has a different idea in mind. Montez reaches behind his back for a hidden pistol, only for Jonas to Spartan kick him right into the waiting jaws of the Meg, making all three bad guys down. But the fight isn't over yet. Zhu Ming gets grabbed by the octopus and dragged underwater, but at the last second, Mei Ying throws him the makeshift bomb which he jams straight into the side of its head, causing a massive explosion. Unfortunately, it's not enough, and the creature reaches up to grab him once again, when suddenly, his pet shark appears out of nowhere, chopping through one of the monster's tentacles and dragging it down into the darkness below. Now they have to rescue Mac, but the largest Meg of all is circling them in. Thinking quickly, Jonas grabs one of the broken helicopter blades and begins slapping the water, getting the shark's attention. The massive beast lunges right towards him, but ends up chomping down directly onto the blade, piercing a hole straight through its head. The shark topples over, sinking down to the bottom, and that makes two Megs down with one more to go. Okay, no, just no. You cannot tell me that this man just held up the largest shark ever seen with nothing but his muscles and some pebbles for added stability. I'm sorry, but after everything that we've seen, this is where I draw the line. I mean, am I crazy here? Or would that thing not have just kept right on falling and flattened Mr. Plot Armor McGee like a pancake? There was really no other way for this to play out though, except for one. You see, this all happened because they had to save Mac from the helicopter crash site. But if he'd taken a page out of Zhu Ming's book and bailed the second that he realized that the bird was going down, then he would have already been back on dry land and far away from any danger. And they could take out the last Meg by more logical means. Like a good old fashioned military airstrike. Well, putting the laws of physics aside, that was a pretty impressive final showdown. But it's not over yet, because there's still one last shark in the water, and a long way back to dry land. As the three of them swim back to shore, they notice the last Meg coming right towards them. But Zhu Ming says that it's okay, because this one is really his friend, 
Diving below the water, he takes out his button and presses it two times, and just when it looks like the shark is about to eat him, she seems to recognize him and decides to swim away, going after some dolphins instead. Jonas can't believe it's possible, but whatever really happened, it worked, and they made it safely back to shore. The Megs are gone, and the island is safe. They've fought 60-ton sharks, a giant octopus, and even a private army paid for by a corrupt businesswoman, but it's all in a day's work for Jonas and crew. While they're celebrating with drinks as they wait for the Coast Guard to arrive, Rigus points out that their Meg is still out there and possibly pregnant with baby sharks, but they decide that they'll tie that up in the Meg Part 3. Jonas couldn't be happier. But what would you do? If you found out that there were more of those big ass sharks swimming around in the depths of the ocean, would you follow the rich people down into the bottom of the ocean again in hopes that the adventure would somehow be different? Or would you stay your ass on the surface and worry about yourself this time? Forget those rich scientists. Let us know down in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out the How To Be playlist for more videos just like this. Be sure to check out The Kill Plan, the new show which just launched on the channel. And uh, oh yeah, have a damn good day.